Hi, everybody. Good morning. I am Tracy Lester. I'm an executive committee member for the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable, and I'm also the vice chair of the board of directors. We are so happy to see you today. Welcome to the second in-person gathering of Face to Face 2022. Some of you may have been in person with us in Queen, at the Queens Museum last week. Yeah, it was amazing. It was a beautiful setting. We were so happy to be there. And we're delighted to be here today at Mark Morris Dance. We want to thank our friends from Mark Mar at Mark Morris for making this space available. We are here today because the arts matter. The arts transform. The arts heal. The arts unite us, they inspire us, and I could go on and on, but I think you'd agree. I joined the Roundtable Board of Directors about three years ago because I believe that we can make a difference in the lives of children and families, and because I remember firsthand the impact of the arts on my life and on my upbringing. I'm the daughter of a jazz musician, I'm the daughter of an educator, and I'm a mother of a child who dances and is an artist, and the arts make a difference for all of us. I wanted to just share a brief story with you about how arts education impacts my life and why I do this work today. Many years ago, I was in intent attending an outdoor event in Atlanta. I was sitting behind a woman who I could hear talking. Her voice sounded very familiar, but I wasn't really sure why. As I leaned in, I thought, that's Mrs. Cohen, my second grade teacher. <laughs> now I'm an adult, right? But I remember that voice. You remember the voices of people who impact your lives. I remember how she encouraged my creativity, how she encouraged me to enjoy education and enjoy the arts. And I remember that all the way into adulthood. So I leaned in and I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, are you Mrs. Cohen? And she said, yes. And I said, I just want to thank you because you were one of my favorite teachers. And that stayed with me for decades. So it matters what we do, and it matters what you do. And the work that you're doing is transformative, and I just want to say thank you for all that you do. In addition to being on the board of directors, I'm also a longtime nonprofit executive, and I am the executive director of the Center for Fiction. And the Center for Fiction is a literary arts organization that supports readers and writers and promote storytelling. We're right next door. And so, <laughs> um, I just wanted to share with you that um, throughout the day and after the conference, you're invited to come to the Center for Fiction. We have a bookstore and a cafe, we are open. Um, there are coupons on the table that you can take. We're offering discounts on cocktails, beer, and uh, purchases at the bookstore. <laughs> so please take advantage of that and have an opportunity uh, so thank you again for being here. I now would like to welcome Kimberly Olson, the uh, incomparable executive director of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. Great, thanks so much, Tracy. And hello, everyone. It's so great to be here face to face again. <laughs> As Tracy said, my name is Kimberly Olson, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. Before I give some logistics and uh, about the day, I'm actually going to pass it over to Mark Morris himself, who has uh, a video that he has recorded for us, just welcoming us to the space. So, Alex, hit it. Hello, I am Mark Morris and welcome to the Arts in Education Roundtable's annual face-to-face -face conference and welcome in particular to my home, the Mark Morris Dance Center, which is where the Mark Morris Dance Group, my wonderful company of the, over the last 40 years, um, is based and we also have a big school and a big organization of people who want to work in music and dance. Uh, professionals, casual, children, drop-ins. It's an incredible uh, range of activities that happen here. 
I am so proud of all of this, and I want to welcome you, this room full of arts educators of every stripe, um, for joining us in producing dancers, uh, friends of dance, audience members, supporters of the arts, patrons in every way of dance and music and the allied arts, the lyric arts, all of it. I went to a school, <clears throat> I went to a dancing school in Seattle that was called Verla Flowers Dance Arts. And it was a neighborhood school, a wonderful woman who ran it. And I studied Spanish dance and ballet. And she also taught, at the time was very popular, uh, a triple threat class of tap, tumbling, and ballet that took an hour. It was covered all the bases. Um, I learned so much working in a neighborhood school, and I never, personally, I never went to college. I didn't go to a conservatory. Hooray for people who have, and what a wonderful opportunity. But the dancing school that I went to is pretty much what this is now. So it's meant to be for all people of every sort of shape and description and um, ability and disability and, uh, I don't know, interest for if people want to become professional dancers or just watch things. Everyone is welcome here and it's been a, fam a fantastic community experience as well as my headquarters. So this, is, this organization is a whole bunch of different people at all different levels of involvement and skill. And we are here at the Mark Morris Dance Center, very glad to be one of the venues uh, that was selected to host this event this year. So welcome everybody to this, uh, to this round table and to the Mark Morris Dance Center, our home, and you're welcome to join us here. Thank you so much, Mark Morris, to your incredible staff for the warm welcome. Uh, the Roundtable would now like to acknowledge that we work and live on unceded lands, the place that is widely known as Mark Morris Dance Center and also Fort Greene, Brooklyn, exists on the contemporary, ancestral uh, homelands of the Canarsie and Muncie Lenape people. These sovereign nations and their communities are still thriving here in New York City, and we continue to occupy their lands. We would like to give a moment of respect to them, as well as to the black and immigrant communities which have helped build the city that we know today. Thank you. Now, like I said earlier, we are so energized to be in this space with all of you. We have 150 people that are gonna be gathering here today between presenters, participants, speakers, students, volunteers, staff, board, the works. So we're just so glad to be in community with all of you. We truly believe that you are superheroes. The work that you do in and around New York City across all five boroughs, it has helped sustain our city before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and will continue to do so after the pandemic. It is truly an honor to act in service to all of you um, as artists, as educators, cultural workers, etc. Um, so, before I hop into my cruise director mode and tell you where the bathrooms are and all of that, I also just want to give a brief acknowledgement as well. Um, we have a friend in government that is joining us, Assemblymember Brian Cunningham. Uh, <laughs> Assemblymember Cunningham represents uh, District 43 right here in Brooklyn. Uh, I know he was a student here in New York City schools and now in his current role is going to be advocating for our students, advocating for the arts. We are so grateful to have you here for your support of our community and for our city's young people. So thank you so much for joining us. And with all of that, uh, again, I'm Kim. If you see me roaming around, please do say hello. Uh, it is truly a pleasure of mine to be able to meet all of you. It makes me better at my job as I get to meet more of your, you and hear more about your incredible work. So please do stop me and introduce yourselves. And with that, I'm gonna to toss it over to my colleague who is also our fabulous keynote today, uh, Stephanie Johnson Cunningham. Stephanie is the co-founder and executive director of Museum U, an organization that centers the experience of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, 
Asian, and all creatives of color. As an advocate for arts and culture, she has been on the forefront of developing invaluable resources that deepen public knowledge and understanding of art, history, and culture. Join me in welcoming Stephanie Johnson Cunningham. Tracy for that uh, wonderful opening, and also the advisors and board, the committee uh, for this year's New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. It's a privilege to be here to discuss my work and specifically to discuss Hugh Arts NYC, um, an initiative that I've been hammering away at day in and day out this past year. But before I get started, definitely wanted to just share a little bit about um, Museum Hue and the work that we've been doing. So Museum Hue was founded seven years ago, very intentionally um, thinking about the experiences of black, indigenous, Asian, Latinx, and all people of color working in arts and culture. I am a product of New York City. I went to school here in New York. I am a product of public school. I grew up just 20 minutes from here in Flatbush, Brooklyn. And so knowing very much intrinsically uh, the experience here in New York City is very diverse. But knowing that in my experience in working in arts, uh, that there wasn't equitable approaches to arts and culture. And seeing that very early on again um, in my formidable years in elementary school, I remember when we took our trips to museums and other art spaces, it was always to really wonderful places like the Met and Lincoln Center and other places like that. But also realizing that I had to learn about Alvin Ailey and Studio Museum in Harlem and Schomburg all on my own. These weren't uh, spaces that were introduced to me in the school systems, right, at the elementary level, also in middle school, uh, high school, and then also in the, at the tertiary uh, level as well, um, my experience going to Brooklyn College. So literally, um, you know, New York City through and through. But with my work, what we work to do this past year is to really look at ways that arts and culture uh, within communities of color impacts us in many different ways. And so Hugh Arts NYC, uh, we embarked on this initiative for, again, very personal reasons to really look at how we can think about these arts entities and the impact that they have within our community. So one thing that we also wanted to really kind of bring home with Hugh Arts NYC was that it was a collaborative effort. So just to rewind a little bit, um, in 2015 when Museum Hue started, um, we really were looking at visual arts and then have expanded to looking at performance art, theater, music, dance. Um, but before then, what we really were looking to do is to think critically about um, these spaces and how to preserve the spaces for the future of New York City. So Hugh Arts NYC uh, was created in collaboration with Museum Hue, the Laundromat Project, as well as uh, Hester Street. So you may be familiar with Hester Street, they're an urban planning organization that designed Create NYC in about 2018. It was the first cultural plan created uh, for New York City. So they were at the helm behind that. And so Hugh Arts NYC is a collaborative working to map the future for arts entities founded and led by black, indigenous, and all people of color. And so the project team and goal was to first lift up these arts entities as major cultural and community anchors and as an integral part of the New York City arts and culture landscape to expand the definition and understanding of arts and culture life in New York City. Three, define the unique characteristics, strengths, and needs of the arts entities within communities. 
Four, better understand the breadth and scope of the arts entities by researching and mapping their presence across New York City's five boroughs. And five, increase awareness and visibility of the wealth and diversity of New York City arts entities that serve New Yorkers across race, ethnicity, language, and communities. And so this project um, really looked at ways that we can think about how to move this um, initiative in a way where we were also engaging people who were already working and in the, the kind of trenches of this issue. And we had a really robust, <clears throat> really robust um, advisory committee team of folks who came from different artistic backgrounds, who represented the, all the different five boroughs, and also come with different identities, racial identities, and also looking at the intersectionality of their experience. And so it was really great having people from vast backgrounds really join us in this effort. And what was really uh, amazing about having this dynamic group was that from very early on when we met, they stressed that how important it was to, to, of course, talk about the inequities that these institutions have faced over the years, but most importantly, to emphasize their resilience um, and resistance through arts and culture. And what we discussed and really learned about these entities and many like them was that many of them are not necessarily interested in growing bigger, uh, but growing deeper. Um, within their communities and growing in their practice and needing funding in order to execute that. And so we really relied on data. So looking at data sets really to visualize what we already knew, what was happening uh, in the field. So we already had anecdotal evidence, but to really own in on what was happening, we really focused on collecting data, and we did so through not just our advisory board, but also uh, our um, community conversations, and also the extensive surveys that we collected as well, just showing the experiences and also uh, the stories of these arts entities. And so this page shows um, the entity's founding and self-description. And we started with about 40 um, arts entities throughout uh, the five boroughs, just to get um, a, a small study starting, but we hope to collect at least between 200 and 300 um, surveys. And so we were thinking about their organization type. Most people, when we started this project, we thought very critically about what the criteria would be. We thought critically about uh, who was going to be added to Hugh Arts NYC. What was Hugh Arts NYC going to look like? And so the criteria that we came up with at first was, um, of course, founded and led by Black, Indigenous, Asian, Latinx, and all people of color. One, two, based in New York City. Three, the um, arts programming that's public facing. And another one was that it was also a nonprofit. But we quickly saw that we couldn't only look at these arts entities from a nonprofit standpoint because there are many different models that people face. And not everyone is into the nonprofit model for very different reasons. If you speak to Kamal Weir, who created Black Gotham Experience, for example, he is uh, Black Gotham is a for-profit, and he can explain to you exactly why he decided to do for-profit instead of non-profit. And then we also thought about disciplines as well. And so <clears throat> it ranges from visual arts, literary art, technology, um, theater, traditional folk art, really just the range, the full gamut of what arts and culture practices looks like in New York City. We also looked at where they were operating as well. So another criteria that we had to take off the list was a requirement that they had to have a brick and mortar because we know that a lot of these entities, we're talking about New York City, real estate is real. Uh, gentrification is real. A lot of our community members have been displaced. 
um, or can't afford to stay in the neighborhoods that they serve. And so another example of that is the Bronx Academy of Arts uh, and Dance. They were pushed out of the space that they were originally in for many years. And so we couldn't just look at brick and mortar. We had to look at what exactly or where exactly these entities were working in. And a lot of them were in rented space. Some were working from home. Of course, um, many working virtually, like many of us. Um, some owned their spaces, but that was a very small amount. We saw that the large majority were rented space and working from home, and of course, donated in kind space as well, and co-working space. And then also, the percentage of people of color uh, uh, that they serve within their audience, seeing that because they're located within communities of color, that largely the people who come into their doors are also uh, people of color as well. And so also looking at the percentage of programming designated as free to the public, in large majority, these programming um, are free. So we were looking at literally everything that we could think of really to assess what these uh, entities' experiences were. And we saw that there was also a range of languages being spoken in addition to English. Uh, there were up to 17 languages um, captured um, within, or 17 were the most popular of the languages used among these different arts entities. And thinking about what does that mean as well? So these organizations are also very specifically serving um, largely immigrant communities as well. And then, of course, the funding challenges. Uh, over 60% of those that we um, uh, surveyed were operating underneath um, 500K, and only a uh, small percentage, maybe about 15%, were working with two, 2 million and above. So again, just showing the vast um, differences of these uh, entities, their experiences, their funding, where exactly they, they are in in, in growth and thinking about what we can do through this research to think critically about their work. So of course, because of the funding, there is a lot of challenges with staff capacity and also access to business development. And so a lot of these arts entities suffer because of the fact that, like a lot of arts entities, um, they don't have the funding resources needed to expand their work. So when you consider how much money disproportionately goes to New York City's um, arts entities founded by people of color, compared to the larger predominantly white institutions, we see that there is a huge gap in funding and support. And so we use all of this data really to track, again, where everything is happening within our communities um, and seeing what, how we can really showcase that arts and culture doesn't just happen on Museum Mile, for example, that it happens very much within communities that people um, live. And so we created an online map and directory. That was very important for us um, to do so. And this map was pretty much, I think, the hardest part of um, this research and project that we did. Um, we collected or, compromise, or, or comprised a list of over 400 organizations to the platform. And these organizations um, are mostly, again, located within communities of color. And so right now it's in alphabetical order. This is just a screenshot of it. So you see the different places where they're located as well as you can scroll and search the directory to see where entities are happening based on borough, based on location, based on your local um, um, location and really just seeing exactly how we can support these entities. So the goal of the map is really to increase the visibility of these entities and to expand and diversify both public and private investments in them. And when I say invest, we want to stress that these entities aren't necessarily interested in funding um, to, to um, 
continue to grow deeper in their work, but also what I mentioned as well with staff capacity, thinking about the staff capacity and thinking about business development and learning ways to attract um, new audiences um, as well. So a large part of the uh, research and work that we did as well is looking at the brown paper report that we wrote. So QRTS NYC is uh, the map, also um, the report and the directory. And so with the work of uh, the advisory team and also the partners, Museum Hugh, the Laundromat Project, and Hester Street, we wrote a, a, a brown paper report that really reads like a love letter to New York City. And that's because it really spoke to all of our experiences and really spoke to why we wanted to really um, showcase the importance of these entities. And so I mentioned Museum Hue was founded in 2015 and all the work that we have been doing in amplifying the work of Black and Indigenous, Asian, Latinx, and all people of color. But if you fast forward to 2019, and my experience seeing Wheatsville Heritage Center here in Brooklyn almost close its doors for good really sent a message um, to many of us in the arts field that these institutions are at risk of closing. Um, Rob Fields, the executive director of uh, Wheatsville during that time, shared openly that the institution had been operating in the red for many, many years and had to really embark on a really radical fundraising strategy. And this fundraising strategy not only got him the funds needed to continue the organization, but through his advocacy, uh, he was able to get Weeksville added to the coveted um, CIG group, the Cultural uh, uh, Institutions Group, right? CIG, where you get funding from the city, and there's about 33 um, organizations within the CIGs, and the majority of that, 90% or more, of those listed in the, the CIG are predominantly white institutions. Um, Weeksville, and I think Studio Museum in Harlem, are the two black institutions that are now added to CIG, as well as um, El Museo del Barrio, I think is also one as well. So a very small percentage that are represented within that body um, of CIG, of that group. But also, if you fast forward a little bit, January 2020, through seeing the devastation of Weeksville, we also created a national map, specifically looking at museums and other cultural spaces, uh, cultural centers throughout the country created within communities of color. And so at that time, it was shared widely, people were visiting, signing up for membership, uh, for those institutions making donations, and they, many leaders of that organization reached out to me and share that you know people were actually using the map based on our aggregated data we saw that thousands of unique visitors to the site were using the site were um you know clicking on different websites and so that was really great but then you fast forward just a little bit to march 2020 we're in a global pandemic where we now see that there is greater inequalities within our communities and all of our institutions had to shut down uh, for the pandemic, but then there was risk for these institutions opening back up. So we really wanted to emphasize this within uh, our report and within the opening letter, I had the opportunity to speak very candidly about that. And so you see a bit about Wheatsville and about my experience growing up in New York City and experiencing arts and culture. And within all of the folks that we spoke to for the report and for this research, we, we spoke to over 100 people um, uh, throughout New York City um, with our community conversations and with our listening sessions, which was really incredible. Um, to learn uh, more about my city um, very um, um, deeply. And so we, through this work, had six key findings. 
And one was that POC arts entities are deeply embedded in their communities and often relied upon to provide more than just arts programming. Um, they also offer social services. Two POC arts entities are often connected to a sense of place and neighborhood, but rarely have a truly stable space for their own. Uh, these arts entities are resourceful and resilient in the face of a long history of structural racism, chronic underinvestment, and limited financial support. For the dearth of data and metrics on POC arts entities in New York City is significant and remarkable, creating barriers to truly comprehensive field knowledge, visibility, and impact. Five increased staff capacity and the ability to support artists are urgent and fundamental priorities for POC arts entities. And six, POC arts entities face uh, significant challenges in securing adequate funding in comparison to predominantly white arts entities. And so through much of our um, key findings, we also came up with six recommendations. And number one, most importantly, was create a designated $100 million fund for POC arts and culture entities. Now this number, 100 million, didn't just come out of anywhere. It's just like, you know, let's put a huge number because it's important for these arts organizations to be supported. No, it was based on the 412 entities that we were able to identify. If you break that number, 100 million down to serve all 412, that would be at least $250,000 for each organization. So that kind of baseline would help these entities really transform their organizations in real ways. And so we were thinking very critically about what that would look like for these entities. And so with the $100 million fund, where is it going to come from? Where, where are we going to find this money? And so we're hopeful that the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and private philanthropy would amass and distribute a fund of $100 million among the 400 plus. And so these investments must offer multi-year general operating support. Again, nothing unfamiliar with the city. We do the same for CIG, the cultural institution group that I mentioned, right? And so within the city's billion dollar, multi-billion dollar budget, why can't we have an additional $100 million fund specific to these arts organizations? Within the report, within our research, we show how significant these arts entities are for communities. Again, with art programming, fantastic. Social services opportunities, all of those things need to be considered. And we also have to expand the way that we think about arts and culture in New York City. Who gets to be uh, a cultural authority? And many of these organizations have been arguing for their own cultural authority and cultural agency for many years. So we also recognize that this work and advocacy that we're doing has been something that many people have been in the trenches working towards for many, many years. So in addition to that initial $100 million uh, fund, we also want to establish a substantive baseline budget line for POC arts entities in the city's annual budget. And again, we want to be able to have consistent support for these arts organizations because we know that if they have the funding that they know will um, be given each year, they don't have to worry and fret about where they would receive uh, their funding. Three, invest in place as a long-term strategy for POC art stability and thriveability. So the action step that we're looking at here is that these arts entities and coalitions in New York need a significant public and private support fund that is solely focused on helping them acquire long-term and or permanent homes. We have an example here. In San Francisco, they just announced such a plan at the beginning of 2022. So how can our city and our elected officials help us in doing so? Um, recently, um, out in Harlem, Eddie, 
Eddie Gibbs, um, who's a recent assembly member, he um, just announced um, a cultural district uh, for El Barrio in Harlem, which would provide additional funding for that specific community. And so if we do engage our electeds and help them in bringing these issues forward within city council, within the assembly, within the Senate, we can see a significant shift in the way arts and culture operates in New York City. Four, foster career and community building among arts professionals at POC arts entities. So when I started my arts career, I went to Clara Barton right across the street from Brooklyn Museum. And I decided that I would start my arts career at the Brooklyn Museum, so said, so done. And at my internship at the Brooklyn Museum, I realized that you know, it was a really great opportunity, well-resourced, well-oiled organization. And then I had decided to intern at Wheatsville. And I realized very quickly that not only was the content very different, but also the resources made available to both organizations. And so even if someone wants to grow within their career in uh, the arts and stay at a place at like Weeksville, it becomes very difficult because then you aren't able to be paid equitably with, within that entity as you are within a Brooklyn Museum. So what we've seen is that a lot of black and Asian and Latinx and indigenous arts and culture professionals is that we're nurtured and mentored often within these small um, arts entities, but then have to leave on to larger, more funded, predominantly white institutions because we just can't afford to stay. And the Studio Museum in Harlem is such a great example of that. Uh, Kehende Wiley uh, started, uh, you know, did one of his most significant artist residencies at Studio Museum in Harlem, and then um, received other opportunities in other spaces like the Brooklyn Museum, and then went off to paint uh, President Barack Obama. We see the same with the curators at Studio Museum in Harlem. They start there, and then now uh, they're at the Whitney, they're at the Getty, they're all over the country at predominantly white institutions. And it's again, great that people can work wherever they want to work, but if people want the opportunity to either stay at these arts entities or maybe come back to these arts entities, it becomes much more difficult because of the funding. So again, what funds can we use to help get paid internships and fellowships at these arts entities specifically? So largely with the diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion um, initiatives that are happening all over the country, which is great at, at some point, right? But diversity, equity, and inclusion has largely been about getting black and brown bodies within white spaces and not necessarily investing in black, Asian, Latinx, and indigenous spaces. And so I think as we continue in thinking about what DEI is, we have to think about the economics of it for our communities first. Um, it's so critical that we be able to sustain our own spaces, our own institution. Institution building is one of the uh, you know, forms of liberation for us still. So we have here an opportunity maybe for paid internships in partnership with the City University of New York, the State University of New York, and other local diverse colleges, universities, and high school. And so thinking critically about creating mentorship and partnerships among uh, POC arts entities. So five, consistently collect data that furthers knowledge and promotes equity in the arts. And the action steps for this is to identify the best metrics and measures for sustained success as defined by POC entities themselves for describing the work of arts and culture entities led by members of the global majority. Create an infrastructure for ongoing collection and analysis of data while providing adequate support to POC entities to participate in this process without undue hardship. So let me say this, I know that data in a lot of ways has been harmful to communities of color and we are 100% aware of that. 
but we're hoping that within the collection that of this data that we are highlighting will be used, of course, mostly to help um, our communities and also looking and making sure that who has this data, who's collecting this data, who's going to have this data. And so making sure that it is within Museum Hue and Laundromat Project and POC Arts Entities um, very specifically. And number six, invest in higher and sustained visibility for POC arts entity in New York City. So this action step is to create collaborative efforts to connect and financially support POC arts entities, access to professional and culturally informed communications, media and public relations, consultants over a sustained multi-year period, directly support and participate in ongoing POC-led advocacy initiatives that seek to bring greater awareness to and action in support of POC arts entities, as well as build a robust campaign to activate local and national media outlets to feature the critical work of POC arts entities, as well as the systemic inequities that have historically limited access to larger success and visibility. And so six for us is very key because we need more visibility, we need more media um, support and visibility for these entities, but also thinking about the pedagogy of these entities I think is really critical, and that's where Museum Hue comes in. So as we continue in this research and in this um, um, initiative for Hue Arts NYC, we're thinking really critically about articles and interviews with uh, leaders from these institutions to really preserve um, their stories and their works and their histories because, again, because of capacity, they don't really have the opportunity uh, or the time, really, to write about their work, to teach us about what they've been doing, how they develop you know, their grassroots experience. All of those things are critical. Um, I remember, when I was early in my career, Lonnie Bunch, who's now the director of the Smithsonian, um, when he wrote his article, um, I believe it's titled A Fly in the Buttermilk, talking about his experience on being a museum professional. And Lonnie Bunch is an elder to me, but learning about his experience was really critical to read about um, you know, his experience and his approach. Um, and we want to be able to have the same opportunity with these entities, have people be able to read about their experience, read about their approach, read about their pedagogy and practice. And we know that many of them can help in transforming the way arts and culture is done in New York City and really throughout the US really because many of these leaders are really uh, focusing on community-centered approaches versus collection-centered approaches or um, looking at uh, ways that they can uh, work with you know, different communities and specifically looking at ways that they can impact communities in real way. And I know the word impact is thrown around so many different ways, but specifically these entities are literally working on impact. So for example, Week School Heritage Center, again, um, had a farmer's market for many years as soon as the weather was nice because they realized that the community is within a food desert. And so how can we provide healthy foods to our community? So these organizations are really looking at impact. They're looking at ways that they can help people survive and thrive um, in the society in which we live. And so one of the important things that came out of um, Arts NYC is the letter that we are also writing uh, to the mayor, to Mayor Adams, and saying support this work, right? And so we are asking that folks take action and sign this, add your name to it. You can go to HughArtsNYC.org and sign our petition so that Mayor Adams will help us in get, get into the $100 million fund for these arts entities and to include um, these arts entities within the city's multi-billion, with a B, uh, dollar fund, and really push the support of these arts entities. So 
So we are QArts NYC, and it's really exciting to have had the opportunity to hammer away at this every day, uh, day in and day out, and I hope you have the opportunity to check out the map, check out the directory, check out the report. Again, it reads like a love letter. It is not dense and boring. Um, it is really just informative about these arts entities' experience. You get to learn about the, Clem the Clemente Soto Center. You get to learn about Amarinda, an American Indian um, arts organization. You get to learn about the National Black Theater. You get to learn so many things about um, the arts and culture landscape throughout New York City. And I hope uh, you know you will have the opportunity to visit them as well now that many of them have opened. So thank you all so much for having me, and um, again, looking forward to you know Hugh Arts NYC growing and take action. Sign the document. Thank you. this incredible endeavor, amazing. Someone actually shared with me and said, have you seen this interactive map that you can find all of the POC-led arts organizations in New York City based on borough, based on uh, art form? Um, look in the neighborhood. It's amazing. Thank you again for that incredible work. <laughs> And thank you very much, also, Assemblymember Cunningham, for joining us, because as you mentioned, this is an endeavor that those of us here in this room can promote, but we definitely need the help of our elected um, officials in promoting the advocacy work that we need to fund and make this work possible. So thank you again for being here. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alexandra Lopez. I am uh, one of the conference co-chairs and the Associate Director of Education at the Center Theater. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, I got started at Inter Hispanic American Arts Center as a stage manager, as a producer, as a director, and then I uh, ended up at Lincoln Center. So uh, you know, it is a pipeline, and it's lovely to think that it can work both ways, that we can um, promote careers. That's one of the sessions that we have after lunch, which is looking at. Um, fostering career pathways to the professions for folks who may not end up being the dancers, but may end up helping to run those organizations and making sure that they are thriving contributors to their uh, communities. Um, I want to take a brief moment just to mention our uh, very generous sponsors who helped uh, make this conference possible. And also, I want to say a, a word to face to face. We have in the past been very um, Manhattan-centric, centered. It's like that's where people tend to coalesce, and one of the things that we try very hard to be mindful of this year is to go to places where the work is being done. So last week we were at the Queens Museum. Today we're so grateful to Mark Morris Dance Group for hosting us and having us here in Brooklyn. Thank you, Brooklyn. <laughs> So among our uh, fantastic sponsors, we have the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, which you also mentioned, New York State Council on the Arts, m and Bank, Disney, Leap NYC, the CCNY Graduate Program in Educational Theater, which has been our previous host for a number of years, uh, Dance NYC, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, the Center for Fiction, which is just like next door, and hopefully will be all going over there afterwards to have a little beverage and a little uh, time to form community there as well, um, and the Arthur Miller Foundation. So a big round of applause for our fantastic sponsors. <laughs> so um, my charge in this brief time that I have with you right now is to set an intention. And I think that Stephanie did such a lovely job of helping us think about the expansiveness of the work that is happening already. And I think that one of the things that I very much want us to consider is sort of how we can make the world that we want to see, right, um, with what we have, 
we have what we need, right? We don't need to think about um, uh, this, this sense of there's like a tiny pie and we all have to scrap over a tiny little slice of it, right? We are expansive, we are uh, abundant, we have access to abundance, and I think that that's the part that I really want us to embrace as we look at um, abolitionist teaching practices this afternoon, or as we look at fostering career opportunities for folks in the arts, as we think about um, how we want to um, create common ground using uh, a new understanding of the arts, how we want to share ideas of how we can do the work in this kind of, I, the thing that I'm nerding out about is that um, the curriculum slams and I'll be there. Um, <laughs> but before we do all of those things and we have an amazing and delicious lunch, I want to introduce the person who's going to lead us through an activation. And I love the word activation because it takes us out of our heads and these um, kind of philosophical thoughts and really helps us put them in our bodies so that we can have a lived experience of it and it really helps us understand what does this look like in practice or what could it look like in practice and how does that help me move to the next step. So um, with that, um, I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, but I am introducing Calvin Long II who is uh, a dance instructor on faculty here at the Mark Morris Dance Group and he is also the community education coordinator for them. He is committed to engagement within the community through arts, education, and fitness programs. So he's going to lead us through a movement activation, and I'm turning it over to you, Calvin. housekeeping things um, really quickly. So just one, I just act that everybody respects the space and everyone in it, from people, things, the, the, um, everyone that you see around you, to if you can please actively participate. You can do it sitting, you can do it standing, it's up to you. And the third one is just to enjoy. You know, we're all here to create, we're all here to continue to do the good work in arts communications, and we're just gonna do a little movement today, all right? So if I can have everyone please stand to your feet. All right, so the first thing, we're just, I'm gonna guide you through everything that we do today. And I'm gonna encourage you all just to, instead of physically touching, we're just gonna connect with our eyes, okay? So let's just take a moment to close your eyes. And I want you to think about your breath. So let's inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. Are, as if you 
walk in place, I just want you to shift your weight from side to side. One foot, and you move over to the other side. Nice and easy. I'm thinking about my walk from the subway to get here. Passing my favorite bodega, passing this one on the corner. Think about those places that you see everywhere, every time you go into work. Now I want you to think about your legs and your knees and your hips. What are those things doing as we're walking through or going through our spaces throughout the day? Can that transition up into your torso or to your abdomen as well? Moving around your rib cage. We got a lot of dancers in here today. So keep that going. Moving through your fingertips into your hands. Slightly swaying from side to side. Good, now I want us to think about our shoulders. Moving lightly through the space. If you can, you can open your eyes now. Now being mindful of the space and where you are, I want us to just walk around. You can choose to walk slowly, you can choose to walk quickly. Remember, we're making eye contact with our eyes. If you are at one space, maybe go somewhere different in the room. As we're doing this, I want us to just gently roll our necks to one direction. Nice and easy. I saw that catch, nice balance. Good. Nice and easy through the neck. Make it circles with the chin. If you see somebody, acknowledge them with your eyes. Working our way down through our shoulders. Moving those shoulders up and down. Good, can we take those shoulders and wrap them around, take them to the back? Continuously thinking about your breath, think about what you're seeing, think about that eye contact. Moving the shoulders in front. I'm seeing some bouncing action going on. What does that look like in your shoulders? Can we bounce those shoulders up to that? Pause where you are. Let's go down through our torso, right where our ribs are. So let's just move our side to side. I like to put my hand towards my chest that's moving. Very nice. Continue that breath. If you see someone, make eye contact. Good. Can we move that all the way down through our hips? Don't be afraid to move those hips. I'm going to make circles with my hands. Leather jacket, I see you. <laughs> Good. Can we move our knees in a circle? What does that what does that feel like? All right now, I heard some people. If you feel so moved, do so. I'm like stuck. So now I'm thinking about my feet and where they're placed. If I were stepping in sand, what does that feel like? Stepping in sand on a nice warm beach. It's not very solid, it's squishy, it's warm. Your feet kind of move down through the space. So keeping that same motif, let's go back to walking around through the space, walking on sand. Warm sand at your favorite beach. So that means our movement is a little bit different. We're not quite stepping on solid ground, but we're stepping on ground that's gonna move and we're sinking into that, that sand. If we move our fingertips in the sand, what does that look like? If the sand was right where our waist was, and I push my hands to the sand, what does that feel like? If I were to grab onto the sand, would it fall through my fingertips? Would it stay there? Can I move it around through my hands? Can I place them in my pocket to take home? I do that sometimes. Does it all make it to your house? Very nice. Let's start thinking about levels. Okay, you can keep moving around your stance if you like. I'm gonna lift my hands up to the ceiling, embracing that space as above us. Reaching up towards the lights, we're gonna go even further past those lights. Yeah? 
Let's come down to a mid level. So that's either you bending down or you just using that space around you. Who's around you? Who are you making contact with? What are we moving through? Are we now in the ocean? Are we moving through water? Yes. Good. Now, if you feel warm enough, what does that low level look like? Is it you reaching down to tie your shoe? Is it you picking up that pencil you left? Is it you touching down and coming right back up because your knees can't take it? Hey, whatever it is. <laughs> your choices. So let's stay between those three levels high, middle, and low. I'm thinking about water, I'm thinking about sand. Thinking about what I'm remembering is down on the floor next to me. The floor is very important. If I fall, boom, there's the floor. If I'm running and I'm standing not on sand, there's the floor again. The floor is your friend. Let's slowly come up all the way up to standing. There you go. Just taking in the space again. A few more deep breaths. And exhale. Good. How are we doing so far? Excellent. We're going to move a little bit more now, a little bit more quickly. I want us to be more activated, not so low. I'm going to start off with my shoulders moving right to left or side to side. Keeping that bounce on my knees. Mm -hmm. I see you. I'm going to follow what she's doing. She's moving her arms from side to side. She's feeling it. I'm feeling it. If you see somebody that's doing a movement that you like, join in with them. Make that eye contact. I'm going to keep this movement down to my torso in a wave like motion. Mm-hmm. There we go. Uh-huh. I'm gonna add a little bounce to my wave too. Wave and bounce. Wave and bounce. Wave and bounce. Wave and bounce. Hey. There we go. I'm gonna stay at my hips from side to side. I think I know how to move your hips now, so don't be shy. Good. Can we move to our feet a little bit? Maybe one step to the front. Other side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What would it look like if I go over to the side all the time? Oh! Other side. Other side. Very nice. Other side. Good. Can I do a half turn? Front. Turn to the back. One more half turn. Back. Face to the front. Somebody did a whole turn. There we go. To the front. And turn around. Very nice. Keep going. Front. And turn around. Very nice. Whole turn. Here we go. Front. You're all ready. If you get dizzy, you just stand still and bounce up and down and you're just fine. Remember, the floor will catch you, I promise. Very nice. Let's stay here. Let's go through the torso a little bit more. Can you tell I'd like to be here? Maybe front and back? Maybe side to side? Maybe in a circle? The circle's my favorite. Either way. Good. So how about we boogie back to our seats now? Where you were standing, where you were. Mm-hmm. 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 Now we're back at the people that we know we love and see. Let's just take a few deep breaths in from here. Thinking very much about our intention at the beginning. You can keep moving. You know, just keep moving. So just move it through the hips, through the torso, take the arms all the way up. Good. And from here, I just want us to arms shake all the way down. Going through all those levels that we just went over. Then one more time, take a huge inhale through the nose. Exhale. Take those hands all the way back down. Through the back. Good. Now we're going to do a little bit of square right? One shoulder, go back. Just one. Other side. Good. Other side. Good. Other side. Other side. Good. Keep going. Other side. Now switch. Now switch. Good. Can we do that with a single? And right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. I see you. Okay. Let's get on my level. Wait, let me put my knees a little bit. Good. Good. I'm going to take one hip over to the side twice. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Let's bounce it out from here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we roll up the body from the bottom? From the feet to the top. Good. Okay. Three more. Two more. Last one. Can we do that a little bit faster? Here we go. Up. 
Thank you so much. 